Yeah, hi everyone. I'm here to talk about server-side browsers. So let's start with the scenario of this talk. He already spoiled it a bit. It's about link previews. So imagine you are fed up with Twitter and with Elon and you want to create a new social media network. Let's call it a Twitter without the I in this case. And one of the features that you want to support is if your users are sending a link, then you want to show a preview. And in this very simple scenario, we just use curl, right? And then it means our backend will make a request. In this case, the user posted the link to, to kittenpix.org. So we make a SSR server-side request to kittenpix, and then uh, kittenpix server responds with some code. Mm, not that important here. It's just some HTML, and it has a heading and some text in there. And then we could manually try to extract, uh, parse the HTML, extract the text. And then we could get a preview like this. Now, I mean, this is kind of hacky, right, with the parsing the HTML ourselves. And then it also doesn't look that nice. So we want to do better. We want to make a nicer link preview. Now, uh, what would, could we use for that? Well, there are these automated browsers. Maybe you've heard of them, like Headless Chrome, Puppeteer, Playwright. Um, a while ago, also Phantom Chairs was popular. That's, I think, not the case anymore. And you can, with quite a few lines of code, you can make an automated request. So here in this case, I've written it in Node.js. I think it's just from the documentation. Um, we just required a playwright a dependency in the first line. And then we launch a Chromium browser in this case. You could also do it with Firefox. And then you say, oh, I want to open a new tab and then go to this website. So this could be user controlled also in our link preview case. And then you do something with the page. For example, we could add another line of code that does a screenshot and then saves it to a file, and then we cache that file, and then we can show this preview. So OK, let's, let's do this again. Let's go back to our scenario. We now use a browser for our preview. So we replaced the curl here with, for example, Puppeteer. But this talk is not specific to Puppeteer. I only use it as an example, because um, I think it's the most popular or most well-known of these. Um, but in this case, now we make a server-side browser request, so SSB for short in the rest of the talk. And what happens is, well, again, kittenpix responds with the HTML code. But now other things also happen, because now we're using a real browser. So this means this uh, style sheet here is uh, also requested and parsed and executed. And then there was an image. This is now loaded. Uh, and there's some JavaScript. Oh, this is also loaded and executed. And this has some advantages. Uh, so as you can see, the Preview is much nicer. We now have the actual picture of a kitten, which is very important if you link to kitten pics. Uh, and this is basically what we wanted to achieve, right? So uh, we were using this, uh, server, this browser on the server side uh, to render this nice uh, preview. But are there any problems? Well, <laughs> I mean, if there weren't, then I wouldn't be here today, probably. But you can already imagine if you replace curl with Chromium, then suddenly the attack surface is much larger, and we will run into problems. And before I go into more details, I want to do a short recap about server-side request forgery. I guess this is a well-known topic because now it's in the OVAS top 10 and so on. Um, but just that you can, so that we can better compare, like what's the difference to SSRF? I just want to do a recap. So in the SSRF case, uh, the user would post uh, something like this, a link to an internal IP address, for example. So then the web server, um, which does the link previews, would kind of act as a confused deputy. It's just configured to fetch all the uh, URLs. And it doesn't really care if that's maybe an internal IP address that shouldn't be previewed. So unless you have some special countermeasures in place, what it would do is just do a request. And if there are other servers in the network, and the attacker could try just lots of IPs. And then at some point, uh, maybe they get something like this, a uh, preview from an internal, let's say, corporate wiki where there's some secrets or something. So um, this attack has many variants. Like you could also try to exfiltrate local files, uh, abuse the server as a kind of attack proxy. Um, but anyways, this is like server-side request forgery in a nutshell. And we want, don't want to want to spend any more time on this. Uh, just as a comparison. So like I said, we had on one side these server-side requests, or SSR for short. And 
You get them if you, for example, use curl or libraries like requests in Python, or maybe Axios in, in Node.js, something like this. And these are quite useful if you just want to fetch, let's say, a JSON file and then extract something from there. But in some cases, like I hopefully could convince you, a real browser has also advantages, uh, especially if you want to do something like the screenshot of a website. Um, if it's a very dynamic website that needs JavaScript, like you can't do a preview of uh, YouTube without actually executing JavaScript. And in this case, a tool like Headless Chrome Puppeteer Playwright is much more useful. But there's a big but, and uh, in this case, we now suddenly parse and execute the response. So on, on top of all the problems that you have with server-side requests, like the server-side request forgery, this could obviously also happen with a browser, but you have problems on top. And before I will go into this, um, just to, you know, it was it's the session after lunch, so maybe you're already falling asleep because I'm talking about all the scenarios. So let's do a quick, uh, let's say, a flash poll. And I want to just raise your hands if you would say you regularly update your system-wide packages like with apt and pacman, brew, Windows updates. You're not more than, let's say, three months or something out of date. Oh, yeah, I was, yeah, okay, okay. So it seems like most of the room, but it was, the hands were raised very slowly. So <laughs> at, at the beginning, I feared like, oh, God. But it seems most, most of you are like regularly doing a system-wide updates. But uh, what about the, I would say, project-specific packages? Like if you, have, if you have code projects in Node.js or with Python with pip and Java Maven, would you also say you go through your dependencies and you try to keep them up to date on a regular basis? Yeah, OK, so we now have like five, or five to 10 people, OK. Yeah, um, awesome. That was uh, maybe, <laughs> I mean, it's not ideal, but it was kind of the thing I was expecting now. I mean, obviously, this is much more trouble. Uh, because, like, you have so many different uh, projects, and you have to go through each of them. And then if you update something, it's much more likely to break, right? I mean, if I, if I do up get update, then it's kind of unlikely that my system breaks. It could happen, but I think it never happened to me. But if I update my, my node dependencies, then all my... There's so much that can go wrong suddenly, like the database can't talk to my, to my I don't know, crawler anymore, or there's just so much trouble. Um, so yeah, this is what I was expecting. And maybe you can now see where this is going. We have this browser <laughs> on the server side, and it could be outdated. So yeah, let's talk about browsers. Browsers have uh, vulnerabilities on a... <laughs> very constant rate, um, like even each month they publish lots and lots of CVEs, and some of them with uh, higher critical severity, and that can also be remotely exploitable by just visiting some special crafted HTML page. And after a while, um, at least for Chromium, these bugs usually get disclosed like 90 days after they were fixed. And in the bug tracker, there's uh, sometimes also very detailed information, like with a proof of concept exploit, and you can download the attachments after it was disclosed or publicly made available. So you would say, no, this is no problem, right? The browsers update automatically, at least on my system. But then <laughs> the thing is, on consumer devices, yes, so on your laptop, desktop PC, and so on, this browser should Normally, unless there's some company-wide policy that prevents that, but normally these browsers should update, so you should not be in more than 90 days out of date. But if you use something like Puppeteer or Playwright, then the browser is actually bundled with that specific. So you have you install Puppeteer at a specific version, then you also get Chromium at a specific version. And unless you update your Puppeteer, then the Chromium also doesn't get updated. So even if on, on my machine here I have the latest uh, Chrome browser installed, and that's constantly updated, if I then uh, run a node, start my Node.js project, then it will use another version of the, of the browser, like this older version that's uh, bundled with the Puppeteer. And this is by design, like it says on this quote from the documentation, uh, for interoperability reasons and so on, they, they, like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't just exchange the browser version without also exchanging the Puppeteer version. So let's boil this down. Uh, the issue in a nutshell, um, this is me on a server recently. Uh, I just checked, like, there were no updates for me, so I did the update previously. It's just too much output. So apt-get is happy. 
Then uh, I did npm audit, which checks for known vulnerabilities in this folder. It's also happy, there are no vulnerabilities. Then I started the uh, project, or the, like in this case, the main file. It just, um, it just starts uh, the, <laughs> the browser and outputs the browser version. It says, okay, it's headless Chrome 86. Now, um, 86 is very old. Um, why is this the case? Oh, let's look into the package JSON. Seems like around two years ago or something, I started this project and I never bothered to update the dependencies. So I'm still on Puppet 5, which is surely is very out of date. So like, it's basically my fault. I just didn't care about the dependencies and I never looked back in these two years and made sure to update them. Um, and yeah, if you were running now this, uh, in the wild, then you would have some real problems um, because this Chrome version is obviously very, very out of date. So, yeah, basically one of the main takeaways of this talk already is make sure you're not only updating your system packages or system-wide software, but also project dependencies, especially if it's something critical like this browser. And what's, yeah, a bit tricky is this, like I don't want to bash on NPM audit, it's just like, the thing is, it's not really their responsibility, right? There's no vulnerability in, in the JavaScript code or in the JavaScript part of the dependencies. It's rather the JavaScript dependency for Puppeteer, again, has a dependency to a binary file. So it's really hard to miss. So if you use something like a security scanning tool that just goes through your dependencies and tries to tell you if you're safe or not, then the problem is the CVA is not assigned to Puppeteer but it's assigned to Chromium, and you really need to know that which puppet version comes with which version of Chromium. So these vulnerabilities are yeah, easy to miss, probably. So, okay, how, how would this attack then work? I mean, maybe it's already clear from all the information that I've gave you, but let's just quickly walk through it. So instead of uh, pointing a URL to an internal service, like in the server-side request forgery case, we now use a domain that we control that's just publicly reachable, let's say attacker.org, and then we send this to our Twitter clone, and then they will happily visit this with their maybe outdated puppet here, and then we respond with some HTML that will make the browser crash, so we look through the bug tracker and look for detailed information about uh, what went wrong. So we need some kind of JavaScript exploit that's uh, exploitable without user interaction, just by visiting the web page. So we assume this is a given, depending on how outdated the browser is, because for each of the browser versions that I looked at, there was at least one uh, exploit findable. And yeah, then you basically make this puppet crash, and at that point it depends on how, like was it maybe inside a virtual machine or a Docker or whatever, but unless they took special steps to make sure that this uh, puppeteer is somehow isolated and not abusable. And if this is not the case, in the worst case, then the attacker has no code execution on the server and could try to continue his work from there, like, I don't know, propagate through the network or something. So basically <laughs> what this is, is you now have the worst of two worlds. On one hand, you have the uh, vulnerable and outdated components, uh, which is one of the top 10 in the OWASP. And on the other hand, you also have the problems from the server-side request forgery, and if you use this browser on the server-side, you really have both these problems, probably. So, yeah, I hoped that I could convince you that this is yeah, a realistic scenario, and this could happen in the wild, but we wanted to make sure, like, is this just something that would work in theory, or are people actually vulnerable to this? And this is where the second part of this presentation comes in. So we wanted to do a large-scale study. We wanted really to find websites in the wild that using, were using automated browsers that are outdated and that visit user-controlled controlled URLs. So there are multiple open questions that we now need to solve. Like, how do we trigger even these server-side requests? How, like, if we visit a random website, how can, this, how can we make this website to again then visit our server? And then the question is, how many of these that visit our attacker-controlled web server, how many of them use a browser? This is actually the, the easiest question to answer. And then we need to find out uh, which browser version they're using. So are they up to date or are they running something very old? Again, that might maybe sound easy, like, yeah, just look at the, refer uh, the, the user agent header and then you can see what the browser is. 
but this is not exactly the case, as we will see, because not everyone is actually honest in their use agents. And then finally, if we know what browser version, version they're using, then it's not too difficult to find out if they would theoretically be vulnerable to you know, just known information, like not zero days, but rather exploits from half a year ago or something. And for this, we looked at 100,000 websites, or at least tried to. Well, not all of them were online, but there are these popular lists of websites. And then we just went through the 100,000 most popular websites and tried to check if this is happening. How did we do this? Well, yeah, like I said, we had this URL ranking, the list of the URLs that we wanted to visit. And then we were using something like Puppet here. So uh, I used Headless Chrome. Um, I'm aware of the irony of uh, using Puppeteer to discover insecure Puppeteers. <laughs> um, so it's digging its own grave here. Um, and with this Puppeteer crawler, um, we also went deeper into the websites, like we visited around 50 subpages for each of these domains so that we can discover more functionality. And the goal of this study in the, in the first place, or the very first step was, OK, we visit their web server. And what we want is that their web server, or at least is another server that they control, um, then suddenly starts to visit our server. And how, like, how do we get from here to here is the first question. And um, yeah, this is where this question mark comes in. So we, we did something with the website, and then suddenly they start visiting us. Well, what, what could we do? Well, we tried three different approaches. Um, so all of them. Um, and we want to entice them to visit us. So we need to spread our URLs somehow. And well, the uh, first and probably most obvious way to do this is if we encounter a form on the website, then we put a link in there that points to our web server. Now, obviously, there are some issues with that. So we try to not spam too many websites with our links. So we try to make sure that we don't resubmit the same form if we discover it on another website and so on. So we had the, some limits and approaches in place. But there's also other issues, like how if this form wants a lot of information, how can we make sure that we put a number where a phone number is required and a name where a name is required and so on. But it's not really what I want to focus on this talk. So another rather easy approach is that if you visit these websites, you just hard code the referrer header. So every time we visit a website, we just replace the actual referrer that we had by crawling deeper into the site with uh, something that pointed to our server. And lastly, which is maybe the most interesting part, um, but wasn't that helpful actually, um, is the query. So if we go through the website and we check all the links. And if we see a link, something like this in the first line, where they have from and then something that looks like a domain. So anytime we discover a, a value that looks something like a domain, we replace it with something that points to our own server. And as you can see, there's this ID. Um, was obviously much longer in, in the actual experiment. But um, this was. So without this ID, we wouldn't know who visited us, right? So we, we do a crawl and we visit 100,000 websites, but we need to figure out um, at which point, like when you fill this form, um, and then there's a request incoming, we need to know, OK, this was actually the website X that we visited. So each of the websites that we visit gets assigned an ID, and then we know, OK, yeah, they're coming from, I don't know, X, Y, Z. So if this works, um, if we get their web server to visit us. Then we respond with some HTML and JavaScript. And this is, I would say, the easy part, where if they execute the JavaScript, we know it can't be curl, right? So they, they have some JavaScript parsing execution in place. It's most likely a real browser, not some emulated stuff. So in this case, the, our JavaScript that we deliver just has a very small script um, that makes sure to ping our server again and send some additional data. So if we receive this uh, incoming XHR with some additional fingerprinting data, then we know, OK, they must be running in a real browser. So this is rather the easy part. So um, this is what I just said. Yeah, we send some JavaScript. And then if they send back some information to us, then we know it's a browser. But you might say, OK, but how do you actually know it's a server-side browser? Like, couldn't it just be some, someone looking through the logs and clicking on all the links? 
And for this um, study, we really wanted to make sure that our data set only contains um, automated systems. And uh, yeah, we did this approach where you just say, OK, if the visit happens within three minutes, so we visit their server, and within a few seconds, they visit our server, then we know, OK, it must be something automated. And we made a cutoff at three minutes um, just to be sure, reasonably be sure that there was no human involved that constantly sits in front of the laptop and clicks all of the links or refers there coming in. Uh, we thought that quite unlikely, but obviously this means we missed a lot of slow bots, right? So if they had this, I don't know, queue and they visit us half an hour later, um, then we missed some slower bots, but that was not really that problematic for our study, I guess. So some data, uh, we visited around, so we visited top 100,000 websites, but like 20,000 of them were not really reachable or timed out or whatever. And then we also crawled deeper into the page. So we visited around 2.6 uh, million pages. And then we had around yeah, almost 170,000 uh, incoming requests from around 5,000 different domains, roughly. But this includes the, let's say, curl case or the, <laughs> the non-server-side browser case. So if we filter this down to um, requests that had JavaScript active and came in within three minutes, then it's not that many requests anymore. So it was only around 3,000 from around 250 domains. So let's investigate these 250 domains a bit further and their incoming requests. So like I said, we want to make sure, um, or we want to find out what, what browser are they using. And the problem is that the user agent is just too easy to spoof. Like there's just one setting in Headless Chrome where you say like, <laughs> claim to be another browser. So what we then decided to do is we look at the behavioral differences because it's much harder to fake to support or <laughs> to claim to support some feature that you actually don't support and also nobody seems to do or I, know th I don't know for sure, but I guess not many people are really uh, that interested in faking their browsers so they don't seem to manipulate this data. So what we do is we look at the global window object and there's just too much stuff in there. Like this is just a small excerpt. Like there's, I don't know, regular expressions and set and weak map and all these features, but also stuff that I never heard, like byte length, queuing, strategy, just all the objects that float around in the global window object. And we just collect all of these. And then what we do is we look at the compatibility data that is uh, available on the Mozilla uh, developer network. Um, it's very useful because they have this JSON. And this JSON basically says, for each of the features, like which browser introduced it when. So when we have, uh, if we collect a sample in the real world, then we can check, okay, if they support this and this and this feature, then it must be this browser. So let's go through this one example here. It, it, like, it doesn't really matter what these features are. I don't know what RTC certificate means or what this is used for. Uh, we don't care. It's just there. So they had the... Uh, <laughs> so now we are again running into the troubles. It's always the session after lunch. No, OK, seems to work. Um, so in this case, uh, their browser seems to support RTC certificates. So well, we know it must be at least Chrome uh, 49 or newer or Firefox 30, 42 or something. Um, but that doesn't that there are too many versions out there that support this. So let's go further to the second line. Seems like they also had mutation observer in their global scope. That doesn't help us because it seems like this feature was available before the RTC certificate. So we look further, and it seems they support weak ref. So at that point when we did the study, this was a rather new feature. And it was, at that point in time, not supported by Opera and Safari. So if they have this, then it's reasonable to assume that they must be on Chrome or Firefox, or another browser that's like this table might not show all the browsers. And we continue, we look, OK, they also have Trusted Script, right? Oh, that's useful because now we know, OK, Firefox didn't have it. So it must be something like Chrome 84 or newer. And then we look, OK, they don't have the aggregate error sent back to us. Seems like they don't have this in their global window scope. So now we know exactly, like, there's only one possibility. It can only be Chrome 84 because if they had the aggregate error, then it would be 85 or newer. And if they wouldn't have the weak ref, you know, and so on. So basically, it can only be Chrome, like, from this table. So, uh, oh, this, OK, I deleted one more slide. So now you can basically uh, go through this on your own for, the, for the another sample, and then tell me what browser will must be. So 
So do we have a solution? So they have all the features except uh, the trusted script. Yep, exactly. So Firefox 79 or higher in this case. And yeah, if you like this, uh, or if you like these games, then I can also recommend you the Mastermind and Wordle, because it's exactly the same puzzle where you just boil it down to, oh, if it's not this and this, then it must be probably this. So yeah, why did we do this? Well, the problem, well it turns out that a lot of, uh, of these browsers lied about the use agent. So some were really, uh, let's say, obvious. So as you might know, the, in, the, in the HTTP requests, um, there's always this user agent header, but you can also ask JavaScript implementation about the user agent. So, and in some cases, just the header and uh, navigator.user agent said something different, and that's quite unlikely, right? So, but then um, also there were other cases where the user agent did not match the platform. So, you asked the browser, What user agent do you have? And they say, Oh, yeah, I'm on iPhone. And then you ask them, Okay, browser, on what platform are you running? And they say, Yeah, I'm running on Linux. And then I'm like, Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't trust you. <laughs> like, you're lying to me. <laughs> Like, if you're on Windows and if you're on an iPad, then I think you're not running on Linux, right? So something doesn't match here, right? Now, for human users, you might say, oh, yeah, they use some fancy extension that spoofs uh, some privacy extension that meshes, messes with these values. But remember, these were automated systems that visit us within a few seconds. So it's much more likely that they wanted their headless Chrome to appear like an iPhone and were actually running on Linux server, and then the other way around, that I had this automated iPhone that was visiting websites. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Seems a bit more of a stretch compared to the Linux server. So this is the reason why we, why we did this browser version determine. So the data collection uh, was a while ago, and for, uh, because this was so invasive, we also didn't repeat it. Um, and it also took a while to get this published and so on. So to give you some context, uh, we did this in March 21. And at that point in time, uh, Chrome 88 was the latest version. Now let's look what browsers we found. And yeah, we found some Chrome 88. So at least around 20% of the browsers that we discovered in the wild were actually on the, well, let's say, on a rather recent version um, that was considered up to date. But then if we look at the other of the top five most popular ones, the other four most popular ones that we discovered uh, were all like six to nine months or something out of date. So most popular was Chrome 84 from July 2020, which was yeah, around nine months prior. So yeah, and then there was a large chunk that is just shown on the slide. So here were the various browsers that did not occur that often. Um, that we could still fingerprint, and some of them were up to date, like uh, some recent Firefox versions, but they're not shown on this graph because um, like, there would be too many different uh, parts of the pie. So why is this a problem? But I actually already motivated that, right? So if we just go through the list of vulnerabilities, um, we find for each of those versions at least one um, high or critical problem, and it's not like, uh, so I looked through them, and then I found it reasonable to exploit from remotely. So they said something like exploit heap corruption via crafted HTML page, or perform a sandbox escape via crafted HTML page. So um, this is not the vulnerabilities that you want to have in your automated systems, right? So let's look at the results. Um, for this around 250 domains, where I said, OK, we have a server-side browser with you know, JavaScript execution that visit us fast within after our visit. And then the uh, most popular websites would be here at the beginning of this chart. And now the, the ranks then, the rank increases, but they get less popular. And here you can see how many of them used a server-side browser. So the top 10,000 websites used around 50 of them. So they were more popular on the uh, also popular websites. But then what happens if we overlay that with the vulnerabilities? And you can see <laughs> quite a lot of them were vulnerable. So we had around uh, 170 of the 250, roughly, that were vulnerable. So this is like two-thirds. So 
I want to say don't focus too much on that we only found 250 domains out of the 100,000 because there were so many reasons why we couldn't discover these uh, server-side browsers automatically, right? So we had a limited crawling depth, so we, we did this very large-scale crawl, but that means for each site, we didn't go very deep. We did a shallow crawl of many different sites, but we never went deep. We had no user interaction, like if you would pen test manually and have I don't know, burp running in the background, you probably would find uh, a lot more of them than our system that you know, can't log in, it can't do complex multi-step flows or something. So there are like, many reasons. Also, the bot detection was very conservative with uh, only counting bots that visit us within three minutes. So I think there are many reasons why we missed some of the server-side browsers here. But on the other hand, for those that we discovered, the majority was of them was vulnerable. So it seems like if you have a browser on the server side, then it's very hard to do it right. So this is the message that I want to focus on here on the slide. So that already slowly brings me to my takeaways. So let's talk about quickly about countermeasures. So I guess you're aware of the server side request forgery problems and countermeasures. Roughly boils down to isolate the machine from your from the rest of your machines and then make sure there are no other sensitive services running on the same machine, like on localhost. And make sure that you enforce the protocol because that prevents some fancy attacks with lesser known protocols like the Gopher one. So if you just say the URL has always to start with HTTPS, then kind of already prevents some of the attacks at least. And then some of the recommendations say yeah, do, do a allow list of destinations. I'm not sure if that's really reasonable in practice. I mean, we saw the link preview case. It was just SSF by or the visit arbitrary websites by design. So that's not always the case. I mean, if you, for your service, if you can just say, oh, only these five domains are allowed to be visited, that's great. But in practice, I think it's very hard. You have stuff like open redirects, DNS rebinding, and then the link preview use case, which just should allow arbitrary websites. So anyway, um, preventing SSRF is already tricky. But then on top of that, we had the problems because it was now a real browser with JavaScript execution. So now suddenly, you also have to make sure that you keep this browser up to date, that you regularly update the project's dependencies, like Puppeteer Playwright and so on. And then, like I've shown you, um, some security audit or scanning tools might miss these vulnerabilities because they're bundled, right? So there's no vulnerability in your JavaScript code, but anyways, the JavaScript call, code then calls into a native executable, and that's vulnerable. So that's kind of yeah, tricky to see. And what you also may, should try to achieve is that this browser, you just assume this browser is actually, uh, let's say, exploitable, but then you sh the attacker shouldn't have too many ways of doing additional harm. Like, you obviously try to run it as a non-privileged user and then uh, try to make sure that on this machine there are not too many secrets lying around, like in the environment variables or uh, other dot .files or something. So that if this browser process then uh, is exploited, then that the attacker has not too much value out of that. Yeah, so for summary, um, I think we have a very unique attack surface here because we execute untrusted code on the server side and then that inside a browser, which contains this very critical security sensitive bugs at quite a high rate, like every, like if you compare it to server software like Apache or something, they sometimes have vulnerabilities, but if you compare this to the rate that the browser has vulnerabilities, it's really like no comparison, so with the browser you really need to update much, much more frequently, like your Nginx or Apache or whatever. They just sometimes have a critical bug and not like every month. So it's this really dangerous combination of having this browser on the server side and then not also not automatically updating it. And then the other takeaway is here, okay, yeah, we might have not found that many uh, server side browsers, but two out of three of them were vulnerable, so it seems to be really hard to get right. So yeah, thank you for your attention. Um, we have now time for some questions, and you can also reach me afterwards. <laughs>